another, another major influence. He obviously was inspired in France by the French Pleiades, the group of French poets who were deliberately trying to make the French language into a really good language, particularly for poetry and, and, and um, writings and so on of that sort. And Bacon spent several years at the French court, came back very inspired and wanted to do the same thing for the English language. Upon his return to England, he was sent to study law at the prestigious Gray's Inn in London, where his statue can be seen today. It was here that Bacon formed the beginnings of his own literary society, a secret group known as the Knights of the Helmet. The Knights, Knights of the Helmet were actually, it's actually the name of a mask he wrote, um, or it's thought he must have written, because um, masks were put together by a lot of people uh, for the royal court or for the Inns of Court, which was where the lawyers were. And to get, get a job as a lawyer or um, a, a minister or official in the government, you had to be, a law, first of all, a lawyer, and you had to know how the royal court worked. So every year they had to put on huge celebrations imitating the royal court, and part of that celebration was masks. And many people um, were involved in creating these entertainments with their masks. Francis Bacon just one of them, but he became a key one, and he wrote quite a lot of the, of, of the mask material, which one can identify. You know, once you, once you get to know Bacon and his writings, you can identify what was done. And he's acclaimed uh, by the lawyers as being the great, great one who inspired them and led them and wrote for them, you know. Um, but, but the, Knights of the Hel Knights of the Helmets was the name of one of the masks at a key moment when the whole Shakespeare authorship, uh, the name of the Shakespeare was being used for the first time. The Knights of the Helmet took as their inspiration the Greek goddess Pallas Athena, who carried a spear and who wore a great helmet, a symbol of secrecy. According to tradition, one that wears the helmet of Athena becomes invisible and they had to swear allegiance to it. Not only that, Athena, the goddess Athena, carried a spear that she shook in the eyes of ignorance. And she was one of the greatest goddesses among the Greeks, ruling through intellect and man's wisdom. Even as Dr. John Dee had been inspired by angelic beings, some researchers believe that a spiritual encounter with Pallas Athena gave Bacon the inspiration for his life's work. Well, in some of those cipher writings that he had written, he, he writes there how this, um, he heard a heavenly voice. The voice he heard inspired him towards secrecy and to imitate the work of God. The divine majesty takes delight to hide his work, according to the innocent play of children. Surely for thee to follow the example of the most high God cannot be censored. Therefore, put away popular applause, and after the manner of Solomon, the king, compose a history of thy time, and fold it into enigmatical writings and cunning mixtures of the theater. That was his mission in life. And for the rest of Bacon's life, he, he was dedicated to that one purpose. Baconian scholars believe that Bacon's revelation led him to develop a series of theatrical works that would teach the English people and transform them into a nation that could one day dominate the world and resurrect the Atlantean dream. Believing that he put away popular applause as his heavenly voice had commanded, he is said to have written behind the identity of William Shakespeare. Shakespeare is a synonym for Apollo and Pallas Athena. They're both known as shakers of the spear in classical tradition. And the spear represents a ray of light, a ray of wisdom, and they shake that spear at the dragon of ignorance. Exactly what Ben Jonson says in the, his preface to the Shakespeare folio, um, to shake a lance at the dragon of ignorance. And, and, and this, this is the role of an, of an Apollo or Pallas Athena. And they, they have always been the, the muses of, of the other nine muses, who themselves are the muses of all the writers, poets, artists, and so on in, in, in history. So, so Apollo and Athena are the great inspirers. They're the great Shakespeare's. 
Bacon incorporated these Greek gods within a key symbol, the double-A headpiece representing Apollo and Athena. Usually one of the A's is shaded, denoting a light and dark side. This symbol is found printed at the head of certain pages within the Shakespeare folio and among the acknowledged works of Francis Bacon. Of the two polarities, Apollo and Athena, it was Athena that seemed to dominate Bacon's imagination. Pallas Athena was, uh, she shook her spear at the eyes of ignorance, so she was the spear shaker. Now, she's always been known as the spear shaker. That was long before the time of Bacon. Back to the Greeks, the, the spear shaker. Uh, so he took that name, spear shaker, and just turned it around to make it Shakespeare. And it used to be written with a hyphen, and then it became one word, Shakespeare, as the name of the playwright for those Shakespearean plays. But what of the real William Shakespeare? the Stratford man whose name has been revered for nearly 500 years. His writings have been attributed to a number of other authors, including the playwright Christopher Marlowe, Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, and even Queen Elizabeth herself. But Sir Francis Bacon seems to lead the pack of would-be bards, with well over 200 books, essays, and pamphlets on the subject, many of which insist he is the real and true Shakespeare. Meanwhile, Baconian scholars argue that the Stratford man simply lacked the experience and education to have written the works that bear his name. There is a mystery because when you look at the plays, everything that's in them and, and what lies behind them in terms of experience, uh, knowledge, and so on like that's expressed through the plays and the philosophy in the plays and so on like that they do not match up with what we know of the life of the actor in fact the life of the actor uh, is quite well known it's, you know it's quite a lot of research been done on William Shakespeare Stratford so a lot is known about his life and none of it matches up what you can deduce from the author from the plays themselves in fact the more we find out about the life of the actor the, the more the worse it gets. Here you have a guy who, who is barely literate enough to make a mark, much less write his name. He, he, his mark was only existent in five documents. There's not a single letter either from him or to him by any of his contemporaries. How can this guy have written the greatest literary works in the history of the world? It just didn't happen. Whoever's the author certainly knew about certain things happening abroad in the royal courts. Uh, in France, in Italy, and in Spain. Not only taught the workings of the court, but the intrigues as well, and who would know that? Certainly not a play actor like uh, the William Shakespeare. There's no way that man could have known the intrigues that went on inside the court. But Francis Bacon did. He was well familiar with it. He was brought up in the court. You can't just say, oh, genius did it all. It's impossible for genius alone to do that. You've got to have all that background, experience, knowledge, and so on, um, to get something like the Shakespeare plays. Uh, there is there's even a quote from uh, one of the justices, one of the en English justices, that it's clear that from the Shakespeare writings that uh, the author had to be an attorney because there is not a single legal error contained in any of them. He writes, the author writes naturally as if he's a lawyer. You know, it doesn't just put in legal terms here and there just to suit the story. It just, legal terms and, and the whole legal jargon just rolls off him absolutely naturally as if he, he's, he's used to living in that environment all the time. Well, that doesn't fit the actor from Stratford. There's just no way the historic William Shakespeare could have written these plays. There's only one person who could have, uh, could possibly have been the author of those plays, which is Francis Bacon. Yet wouldn't the colossal size of all the plays, poems, and sonnets be too much for Bacon himself to complete, especially while becoming a lawyer, launching modern science, and writing the many other works attributed to him. This could be where the Knights of the Helmet took part, as evidence suggests that the plays may have been the collective effort of Bacon's literary society. 
we know from historical records that Bacon actually had a literary group around him. Some of them were actually paid, employed by him, and others just did it voluntarily. A big group. Why? You know, why did he do that? You know, you don't employ a lot, a lot of people, or, or writers, poets, artists, and um, as well as cipher experts and so on. You don't employ them for nothing. So, so what, what did they do? And then you get the answer, the Shakespeare plays, because scholars have found out there's been other contributions in the plays from other poets and so on, and we'll put a little bit in here and there. And then you find that they were either associated with or employed by Bacon um, in that group. They're all part of this, this one group. So then the picture emerges of a, of a typical Renaissance studio. But instead of being an artist, a, pa a painter with his studio pupils, You've got a writer with his studio of pupils working with him. They each contribute a little bit to the picture or the story, but the main, the main artist or author is Francis Bacon himself. But in the town of Stratford-upon-Avon, People come from all over the world to view the birthplace of the man considered to be the greatest literary mind of all time. In Stratford, they hold a strong view against the suggestion that Shakespeare was anyone but himself. It's a conspiracy theory and it's all aimed at toppling the greatest writer who's ever lived. There is a Shakespearean trust in England and these are people who are dedicated to the cause of supporting and maintaining that William Shakespeare, the actor, was the actual playwright. I think it's highly unlikely. Dr. Paul Edmondson is the head of education at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust in Stratford-upon-Avon. In this debate, he is known as a Stratfordian, not just because of where he lives, but because of his traditional view of Shakespeare. The Stratfordians are considered the academic adversaries of Baconians. We asked Dr. Edmondson to comment on the Bacon Shakespeare theory. It first occurred in 1785. A, a, a vicar just outside Stratford um, got to the age of 80, and then there's some report of him burning the papers that he'd been working on, as if in his later years he just kind of renounced any theory that he had about Bacon. It was taken up in 1856 by what a surprise, Delia Bacon, no descendant, but she wanted to prove that Bacon wrote the plays. She even went as far as um, having her, herself locked in Holy Trinity Church to dig up the grave of Shakespeare, convinced that some manuscripts would have been inside the grave saying, I did not write uh, the plays, it was Bacon instead. And uh, she didn't get as far as digging um, up the, the corpse of Shakespeare. And um, later she went mad after the publication of her book. But her, her book was groundbreaking. She had good support from from uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Mark Twain. She knew literary figures in, in the States. Mark Twain was certainly convinced uh, that the historic William Shakespeare did not write the Shakespeare plays. Uh, and, and this is a guy, how can, you, how can you deny his conclusions? He had the money to investigate it. He had the time to investigate it. He's not known as a crackpot in any other venue. In 1909, Twain took up the Bacon-Shakespeare controversy with his own book titled, Is Shakespeare Dead?, in which he questions the reputation of the Stratford actor in his lifetime. He's saying that in Shakespeare's own life, no one regarded him as being important or famous or a brilliant uh, playwright or anything like that. It was only uh, two or three generations after his death that suddenly the historic William Shakespeare became a big deal. So if, if the, the, however, the plays enjoyed immediate success and immediate prominence. So how do you explain that? that that's simply not true. There's all sorts of evidence that he died and that he was remembered after his death. First of all, there's the very significant memorial bust in Holy Trinity Church, which not only is an early likeness of Shakespeare to give us a sense of what the man actually looked like, but it also mentions him as a great writer on the inscription of the monument, see living art, but page to, say, to, to, to serve his wit. I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, but it mentions living art and looking at the page rather than the monument, which is an echo of... Um, or prefigures 
possibly the um, commendatory verse of Ben Jonson, Shakespeare's friend and contemporary playwright, at the front of the first folio. The first folio is the um, first time Shakespeare's works are, are gathered together after his death by his friends. That's crucial. What is equally crucial is that the two tributes mentioned by Dr. Edmondson did not come about until years after Shakespeare's death. Other great writers of the time, like poet Ben Jonson, were given more immediate recognition within months of their passing. Just as importantly, the great folio assembled by Shakespeare's friends seven years after his death contains what many believe to be some important clues. 19th century author W.F.C. Wigston referred to William Shakespeare as Phantom Captain Shakespeare, the Rosicrucian Mask. This may have been partly due to the world-famous Drochout portrait that appears on the front of the original Great Folio of 1623. Note the presence of a line extending from the jawline of Shakespeare to the bottom of his left ear, as if to suggest the face were simply a mask. If this seems far-fetched, consider the dedication which appears beside it, written by poet Ben Jonson, a friend of both Shakespeare and Sir Francis Bacon. With a rather mysterious twist, Jonson concludes with the words, Reader, look not on his picture, but his book. Why would Ben Jonson point the reader away from the face of Shakespeare and compel men to look upon the book instead? A dedication that seems to parallel the monument at Holy Trinity Church, on the inscription of the monument, see living art, but page to, say, to, to, to serve his wit, I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, but it mentions living art and looking at the page rather than the monument. Are these allusions made by the men who knew the real William Shakespeare, that he was simply a mask or front man for Francis Bacon? Bacon paid him off to go and keep his mouth shut. The monument at Holy Trinity Church refers to the page that serves Shakespeare's wit. But when one looks upon the page beneath his hand, it turns out to be blank. Some Baconians believe this is a secret code, alerting the reader that the Stratford man himself wrote nothing. The empty page is said to match the empty expression on the face of Shakespeare, who Baconians argue could barely write his name. It's actually a big embarrassment to, um, you could say, the academic fraternity that believe the actor wrote the plays. The question of Shakespeare's literacy is often mentioned because of the few known signatures he left behind. As one writer puts it, the scrawling, uncertain method of their execution stamps Shakespeare as unfamiliar with the use of a pen. Perhaps a, a modern um, equivalent of this is to say, you know, how good is your signature on your credit card? How good is your signature when you sign your name um, in a shop or uh, on, on a, on a uh, bank transaction or, or whatever? Um, there are several signatures which survive of Shakespeare. How good would you like them to be? While Baconians argue that Shakespeare lacked experience, Edmondson points out that as the son of a glove maker, he was uniquely qualified. Um, there's lots of references to different kinds of leather, for example, it's, um, uh, Feste's line in Act 3, Scene 1 of Twelfth Night about somebody's being, someone's wit being like a chevril glove. Chevril, as the son of a glove maker, Shakespeare would have known, is a kind of kid skin which stretches and stretches and stretches when you're making the gloves. It's a very soft, supple material to work with. And here you have it um, immersed in the wordplay of one of Shakespeare's clowns. Francis Bacon knew nothing about different kinds of leather, I would suggest. Um, actually, you could turn this whole thing on its head and say that Shakespeare wrote Bacon, which something is something that a lot of people don't suggest, because why bother to do it that way around? One of the problems is the um, Shakespearean trust is that while these objections come up to um, 
William Shakespeare being the author of the plays, they refuse to investigate the contrary evidence which has been put forward to them. They refuse to look into it. They refuse to look into the cipher codes that Bacon incorporated in the first folios, for instance. Bacon uses this cipher in, in the Shakespeare work and, his own, uh, and in the work under his own name. Uh, but he also, in doing that, signs his name and the name of the Rosicrucian fraternity. This code system of writing he used all his entire life. The examination of the cipher codes in Shakespeare's plays have filled hundreds of books and essays over the last few centuries. But perhaps the most specific evidence are the presence of Baconian and Rosicrucian emblems in the great folio of 1623 and in earlier works by Shakespeare. Bacon's Light A and Dark A symbol appears, representing the two Shakespeare's, Apollo and Athena. Meanwhile, this Rosicrucian emblem, featuring the god Pan, is found prominently throughout the work. Other mystical headpieces with Rosicrucian symbolism are found both in the Shakespeare folio of 1623 and in works openly published by Sir Francis Bacon. The varied symbols and ciphers clearly mark the presence of Bacon and his Rosicrucian fraternity while to what extent they were involved in the writing of the plays remains a matter of debate. But perhaps the most compelling evidence is that the works of Shakespeare helped to accomplish exactly what Bacon and his Knights of the Helmet set out to achieve. While the numbers vary, the plays are said to have developed some 20,000 words for the English language, with some words being created, older words being revived, and current words being used in new ways. Could the actor from Stratford, with a limited education, have accomplished this coincidentally? The Shakespeare controversy was illustrated quite clearly by Masonic author Manley P. Hall in his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, where he reveals the veiled purpose behind the writing of the plays. He says, Sir Francis Bacon, the Rosicrucian initiate wrote into the Shakespearean plays the secret teachings of the fraternity of the Rose and Cross and the true rituals of the Masonic order. The Bacon-Shakespeare controversy involves the most profound aspects of science, religion, and ethics. He who solves its mystery may yet find therein the key to the supposedly lost wisdom of antiquity. The lost wisdom that Hall refers to is said to have begun in ancient Atlantis. Is this the real key to understanding Shakespeare? Incredibly, it may be said that the plays themselves represent the whole confusion of America's foundation. For while Shakespeare contains a clear representation of Christianity, with some 1,200 biblical references, along with them are plays with openly pagan and magical themes.